You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 178 in Steiner's Collected Works, his set of lectures on secret brotherhoods and the mystery of the human double. This is the last lecture in the book, which is Lecture 7. I will be appending two other lectures that are in the official uh, uh, Collected Works, Volume 178, that are not in the book, but I'm putting them at the end, and they are ba- they're, uh, about psychoanalysis. So... They are referenced in these lectures as well. Uh, this is translated by Joanna Collis. This is the last lecture, Lecture 7, given in Dornach on the 25th of November, 1917, entitled Individual Spirit Beings and the Constant Foundation of the Universe, Part 3. In order to expand on them, I shall today refer back to some of the points we have been considering. For long ages, human beings have had thoughts, feelings, and impulses to help them find whatever they needed to make progress. But now the signs of the times are telling us that these thoughts, feelings, and impulses no longer give us what we require to help us go toward the near future. Yesterday, one of our members showed me last Wednesday's issue of the title Frankfurter Zeitung, In it there is an article by a very learned gentleman. Indeed, he must be exceedingly learned, for his name is preceded by the letters denoting not only doctor of philosophy, but also those denoting doctor of theology. And these are in turn preceded by the title of professor. So this man is very clever indeed. His essay is about all kinds of modern spiritual needs, and it contains the following passage, quote, the experience of the beingness that lies behind everything requires neither pious solemnity nor religious evaluation, for it is in itself religion. It is not one's own individual content that must be sensed and grasped, but the grand irrationality that lies hidden behind all existence. Those who touch it and cause the divine spark to flash across will undergo an experience that is primeval and prototypical. This unites the one who is having the experience with all that moves in the same stream of life. He is vouchsafed a cosmic sense of life, to use a favorite phrase of recent times. Close quote. Forgive me, dear friends. I am not reading this to you in order to awaken any great ideas that might be contained in these wishy-washy sentences, but in order to demonstrate a sign of the times. Quote, a cosmic religiosity is in the making among us, and the strength of people's longing for it is demonstrated by the perceptible growth of the theosophical movement, which is attempting to discover and reveal the gyrations of that hidden life. Close quote. It isn't easy to stumble through all these wishy-washy concepts, but they are, are they not, remarkable as signs of the times? The writer continues, quote, This cosmic piety is not a matter of quietistic mysticism that begins with a rejection of the world and ends in contemplation, for it is received among the rolling waves of events and arouses ever new commotion, close quote, and so on. It really is not possible to make any sense of all this. But since it is preceded by, quote, Professor D.D. and D. Phil, close quote, we must surely regard it as something clever, for otherwise we should have to see in it the stammerings and unclear ramblings of a learned gentleman who cannot discern the way forward on the path he is following, but nonetheless feels obliged to hint at something which does exist and which appears to him to be not entirely without hope. We ought not to find anything pleasing in such outpourings, 
for such outpourings must, above all, not be allowed to lull us to sleep in the pleasant notion that here, once again, is someone who has noticed that there is, after all, something worthwhile behind the spiritual science movement. It would be very damaging if this were to happen, for those who express such outpourings are sometimes the very ones who feel satisfied by them, but who do not press on. In their wishy-washy way, they point to something that wants to enter into the world, yet they remain much, much too idle to to embark on any serious study of spiritual science and of what it is that must take hold of human hearts and souls if these realities are to enter the stream of coming existence in ways that will be beneficial. It is, of course, easier to talk of, quote, rolling waves, close quote, and, in quotes, cosmic feelings, than it is to go more seriously into things which, as the signs of the times demand, must be told to humanity just now. That is why it seems necessary to me to say here what I said and will continue to say in the public lectures, while emphasizing the difference between what is dead and gone with no life left in it, but which has led us into the present catastrophic times, and what the human soul must really grasp if any kind of forward step is to be taken. You could hold thousands of congresses, world congresses, and people's congresses, or whatever, involving the old wisdom which has brought humanity thus far, and thousands and thousands of societies could be founded. But it must be clearly understood that these thousands of congresses and thousands of societies will achieve nothing if the spiritual lifeblood of the science of the spirit does not flow through them. What people lack today is the courage to embark properly on researching the spiritual world. Strange though it may sound, it has to be said that a next step could simply be to spread the booklet titled Approaches to Anthroposophy in the Widest Circles. That would be another way of bringing forward knowledge about the links between human beings and the cosmic order. The booklet draws attention to this knowledge. Attention is drawn to actual facts, such as the way in which the earth changes its states of consciousness year by year. What is said in the lecture and in the booklet is said expressly with the needs of our time in mind. To absorb this would mean more than all that wishy-washy talk of cosmic feelings or mingling with some, in quotes, rolling waves of whatever kind. I have just read these things aloud to you and I cannot repeat them because they are too meaningless in the way they are formulated. This does not mean that we must not pay attention to these things, for they are important and real. I want to make it clear, though, that we must not create our own fog but should always retain the utmost clarity if we want to work for the spiritual science of anthroposophy. Once again, I want to remind you that during this fifth post-Atlantean period, the time is approaching when humanity will be having to deal very carefully with certain great life questions that have thus far been hidden, in a way, by the wisdom of former times. I have already pointed this out. One of these great life questions can be described as follows. Endeavors are to be undertaken to place the spiritually etheric element in the service of external practical life. I have already pointed out that the fifth post-Atlantean period will have to solve the problem of how the temper of the human soul, the flow of human moods, can be transmitted to machines in wave-like movements. The human being must be linked with something that has to grow more and more mechanical. A week ago I spoke of the external way in which a certain part of our earth is taking this mechanization. I gave the example of how the American way of thinking is trying to spread mechanical principles to include human life itself. I spoke of the rest breaks 
that are to be used to enable a specific number of workers to load not fewer tons but up to fifty tons. All that is needed for this is to introduce Darwin's principle of selection into life. At such places there is the will to harness human energy with mechanical energy. It would be quite wrong to think that we should try to prevent these things, for they will happen, they will come about. The only question is whether they will be brought about as a part of human evolution by people who are selflessly familiar with the great goals of earthly evolution and will do them in ways that are beneficial to humanity, or whether they will be brought about by those groups of people who only want to make use of them egoistically or solely for the sake of their own group. It is not what is done that matters in this instance, for the what will happen anyway. The important thing here is the how, how these things are tackled. The what will happen anyway because it is intrinsic in earthly evolution. Welding together human nature with mechanical nature will be a great and significant ongoing problem for the remainder of earthly evolution. Recently I have often very deliberately pointed out, also in public lectures, that human consciousness is linked with the forces of destruction. Twice in public lectures in Basel I have said, quote, we die into our nervous system. Close quote. These forces, these forces of dying away, will grow ever stronger and stronger. Connections will be created between the human being's forces of dying away, which are related to electrical, to magnetic forces, and external mechanical forces. People will be able in a certain way to steer their intentions and their thoughts into the mechanical forces. As yet, undiscovered forces in the human being will be discovered, forces that work on external electrical and magnetic forces. That is the one question, the linking of the human being with mechanisms, this being something that will gain ground more and more in the future. Another problem is the matter of calling on spiritual conditions for help. This will only be possible when the time is ripe, and when a sufficient number of individuals will have been prepared for this in the right way. But it must happen eventually that the spiritual forces are mobilized to have control over life in relation to sickness and death. Medicine will be made spiritual, very, very spiritual. But caricatures of this will also be created by a certain quarter. These caricatures, however, will only serve to show what must actually come about in reality. Once again, as with the other problem, this matter will be taken up in an external egoistic way by individuals or groups. A third matter is the introduction of human thinking into how the human race comes into being through birth and conception. I have pointed out that congresses about this have already been set up, and also that in future there will be a materialistic elaboration of the science concerned with conception and how man and woman are harnessed together. All these things point to significant developments. Today it is still all too easy to ask why those who know about these things in the right way do not put them into practice. In future it will be possible to reach an understanding of what is involved in the practical application of these things and to see what forces are still at work just now putting obstacles in the way of developing a spiritualized science of medicine, for example, or of economics. One cannot do more today than speak about these things until people have understood them sufficiently, those individuals namely, who will want to take them up in a selfless way. Many believe they can already do these things, but many life factors still prevent such a thing, and these can only be overcome by allowing an ever deeper understanding to gain ground and by renouncing for a while at least any direct efforts at practical application on a larger scale. 
in all these matters. It has to be said that not much remains now of whatever existed behind the old atavistic endeavors carried on up to the 14th or 15th centuries. Today people talk a lot about ancient alchemy, remembering the process of producing the homunculus and so on. Most of what is said misses the mark. A time will come when people will understand what is meant by the homunculus seen in Goethe's Faust. But since the 16th century, these things have been shrouded in mist. Awareness of them has receded. The law governing these things is the same law that determines the rhythmical alternation of waking and sleeping in the human being. Just as a human being cannot disregard sleep, so could humanity, where spiritual development is concerned, not avoid the sleep in matters of spiritual science that characterizes the centuries since the 16th century. Humanity had to go to sleep spiritually so that spirituality could reappear in a new form. One simply has to come to terms with such necessities but we must not be downcast about them. We must realize that the time has now come to wake up, that we can participate in working at this awakening, that events often precede knowledge, and that we will fail to comprehend the events going on all around us if we do not make the effort to gain the knowledge. I have repeatedly mentioned that certain groups of people working in egoistically occult ways are making efforts in certain directions. Initially, it was necessary for a specific kind of knowledge to retire into the background for humanity, knowledge nowadays given incomprehensible names such as alchemy or astrology and so on. This knowledge had to disappear, be slept through, so that people no longer had the possibility of drawing soul qualities out of their observations of nature, but were instead more thrown back on themselves, so that human beings could awaken the forces of their own being. It was necessary for certain matters to appear first in an abstract form, which must now take on a concrete spiritual form. Three ideas have gradually been given form over the course of recent centuries. Ideas that are abstract in the way they have come amongst human beings. Kant wrongly called them God, freedom, and immortality. Goethe rightly called them God, virtue, and immortality. What is encompassed by these three words is now rather abstract, whereas in the 14th or 15th century it was more concrete, but in the old atavistic sense also more physical. People experimented in the old way, endeavoring in alchemical experiments to observe processes that revealed the working of God. They tried to produce the philosopher's stone. There is something concrete behind all these things. The philosopher's stone was supposed to help the human being become virtuous although this was thought of in a more material sense. It was also intended that it should make people able to experience immortality by placing themselves in a relationship with the cosmos that would let them experience what lies beyond birth and death. All the wishy-washy ideas people use today in their effort to grasp these things no longer fit with what was striven for in those days. Things have become abstract and modern humanity talks about abstract ideas. People try to comprehend God by means of abstract theology, and virtue too as something wholly abstract. The more abstract the idea, the more does modern humanity like talking about these things. The same goes for immortality. People speculate about what could be immortal in the human being. In the first Basel lecture, I spoke of today's science of philosophy being a starved science and undernourished science in the way it deals with questions such as immortality. This is only a different description of the abstract way in which these things are striven for nowadays. 
Certain brotherhoods of the West, however, have preserved the connection with the old traditions and are trying to apply it in ways that will place it at the service of a kind of group egoism. These things must be pointed out. Of course, when this quarter in the West mentions these things in public exoteric literature, it also talks of God, virtue or freedom and immortality in the abstract sense. But those in the circles of initiates know that all this is speculation and that it is all abstract. Amongst themselves they look for something much more concrete in the abstract formulations of God, virtue and immortality. So in the schools in question these words are translated for the initiates. God is translated as gold and they seek to fathom the question of the mystery of gold. For gold, the representation of what is sun-like within the earth's crust, is indeed something that embodies an important secret. In the material sense, gold relates to other substances as the thought of God relates to other thoughts. The crucial thing is how this mystery is interpreted. This is connected with the way these groups egoistically make use of the mystery of birth. They try to attain a genuinely cosmic understanding. But in recent times, human beings have replaced this cosmic understanding with an understanding that is totally earthly. If they want to study how, for example, the embryo of an animal or human being develops, they point their microscope at what is present at the location on the earth where they are looking through that microscope. They regard this as the thing they should be studying. But this cannot be the case. They will discover, and certain circles are very near to making this discovery, that the forces at work are not to be found in what they are examining through their microscope, but that these forces come in from the cosmos, from the constellation in the cosmos. When an embryo comes into being, it comes into being because cosmic forces streaming from all the directions of the cosmos are at work in the living creature inside which the embryo is forming. What will arise when fertilization takes place will depend on which cosmic forces are active during the fertilization. Something will have to be understood which is not understood as yet. Suppose you have a living creature, a hen, shall we say. When a new life arises within this living creature, the biologist focuses his observation on how the egg is growing out of the hen. He investigates the forces that he supposes are making the egg grow out of the hen herself. This is nonsense. The egg does not grow out of the hen, for she is merely the foundation. Forces ray in from the cosmos and generate the egg on the ground prepared for it within the hen. But the biologist imagines that the forces in question are situated at the spot he is examining through his microscope. Whereas what he is seeing is something that depends on the forces of the stars working together in a specific constellation at a certain spot. The truth of the matter will only be discovered when the cosmic forces are discovered, namely that it is the cosmos that conjures the egg into the hen. All these things are connected above all with the mystery of the sun and from the earthly point of view with the mystery of gold. What I am putting forward today is no more than a schematic hint, but as time goes on these matters will become much clearer. In the schools that have been mentioned, virtue is not spoken of as virtue, but as health. Here the endeavor is to find out what cosmic constellations are involved when human beings recover their health or fall ill. By getting to know the cosmic constellations, one also finds out about the different substances in the Earth's surface, fluids and so on, that are in their turn linked to health and sickness. From a particular quarter, a more material form of health science will be developed, 
which will, however, rest on a spiritualistic foundation. The concept to be disseminated from that quarter is that people do not become good through learning all kinds of ethical principles in the abstract, but through taking, let us say, copper under a specific constellation or arsenic under another constellation. You can imagine how these things can be utilized for the egoistic intentions of certain groups to gain power. Simply by not disseminating such knowledge to others who are then prevented from participating, one has at one's disposal the best means of controlling great masses of the population. Without making any mention of something like this, one could, for example, introduce a new kind of snack. This new snack duly adulterated, could then be marketed. Such things can be done when one conceives of these matters in a materialistic way. One must simply be aware that everything material is filled with the workings of spirituality. Only those who know that in the true sense of the word nothing material exists, but only what is spiritual, can plumb the mysteries of life. In a similar vein, there is the matter of bringing the question of immortality into materialistic channels. This matter of immortality can be brought into materialistic channels in similar ways, by utilizing the cosmic constellations. This does not lead to the attainment of what is often speculated to be immortality, but it does bring about another kind of immortality. Since it is not yet possible to work on the physical body, as a way of artificially extending life, one prepares to undergo certain experiences in the soul that will enable one to remain within the lodge of brothers even after death, when one can help out with the forces that are then at one's disposal. So in those circles, immortality is referred to simply as life extension. Outward signs of all this are already to be seen. Perhaps some of you noticed the book titled Der Unfug des Sterbens, Death is a Nonsense, that came over from the West and made quite a sensation for a time. Such things are all pointing in that direction, but they are only a beginning, for anything that reaches beyond the beginning is still being stored up for egoistic group activities and kept as something very esoteric. These things are possible if they are brought into materialistic channels, if the abstract ideas of God, virtue and immortality are turned into the concrete ideas of gold, health and life extension, if the great questions of the fifth post-Atlantean period I mentioned earlier are used to further the progress, excuse me, purposes of group egoism. What that professor and doctor of theology and doctor of philosophy, wishy-washily termed cosmic feeling, is already being presented by many, also unfortunately in many cases in an egoistic sense, as the cosmic knowledge of the human being. Whereas for centuries science has paid attention only to things that work side by side on the earth and has avoided any glance toward the most important element that comes in from outside the earth, what will happen now in the fifth post-Atlantean period is that specifically those forces which come in from the cosmos will be put to use. And just as the most important thing for biology professors now is to have microscopes that provide the greatest possible degree of enlargement and laboratory procedures that are most appropriate, In future, when science has become spiritual, the important thing will be whether certain processes are put in train in the morning or the evening or at midday, or whether what one has done in the morning can be further influenced by what works in the evening, or whether it excludes or paralyzes the cosmic influence of the morning until the evening. Of course, much water will still flow down the Rhine before the purely materialistic platforms, laboratories and such like are handed over to spiritual scientists. But if humanity wants to avoid sinking into complete decadence, the work of these laboratories 
will have to be replaced by another kind of work. For example, in the case of the good that should be attained in the immediate future, certain processes take place in the morning and are then interrupted during the rest of the day. Then, in the evening, the cosmic streams flow through them again, and the result is then rhythmically preserved until the next morning. In this way, processes take place in which certain cosmic effects are always interrupted during the day and introduced during the morning and the evening. This will call for all kinds of different ways of doing things. From all this it will be obvious to you that if one is not in a position to take part publicly in these things, then all one can do is to speak about them. Those quarters that want to replace God, virtue and immortality with gold, health and life extension are the very quarters which strive to work with forces that are quite different from the forces of morning and evening processes. I mentioned last time that a certain quarter seeks to remove the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha from the world by bringing in another impulse from the West, a kind of antichrist, and that coming from the East, the Christ impulse, as it appears in the twentieth century, is to be paralyzed by distracting people's attention from the coming of Christ in the etheric realm. From the quarter, which will put forward the Antichrist as the Christ, will come endeavors to make use of something that can work through the most material of forces, something that can work spiritually through the most material of forces. More than anything else, that quarter will strive to make use of electricity, especially the Earth's magnetism, to bring about effects all over the world. I have shown you how the forces of the Earth rise up in what I have termed the human double. People will discover this secret. It will be an American secret to use the Earth's magnetism in its duality, the northern and southern magnetism, in order to send controlling forces across the whole Earth, forces that work spiritually, Look at the magnetic map of the earth and compare the magnetic map with what I am about to say, namely the magnetic line where the needle deflects to the east and to the west and where it does not deflect at all. I cannot now give more than hints about these things. Spiritual beings are incessantly working in from a specific point of the compass. All that needs to be done is to get these spiritual beings to work in the service of earth existence. And then, since those beings working in from the cosmos are able to mediate the secret of the earth's magnetism, one will be able to fathom that secret. Thereafter, with regard to those three things, gold, health, and life extension, one will be able to work very effectively in the direction of group egoism, It will be a matter of mustering the dubious courage to do these things. And within certain circles this courage will surely be mustered. Coming from the direction of the east, it will be a matter of strengthening what I have already described by also placing in the service of the earth those beings who are streaming down from the opposite direction of the cosmos. There will be a great struggle in the future. Human science will turn to cosmic influences, but it will endeavor to do so in various ways. The task of good beneficial science will be to find certain cosmic forces that can come into being on the earth through the working together of two cosmic streams arriving from different directions. These two cosmic streams from different directions will be Pisces and Virgo. It will above all be a matter of discovering how what works as sun forces from the cosmos coming from Pisces can combine with what works from the direction of Virgo. This is what will be good, to discover how from two directions of the cosmos morning and evening forces can be placed in the service of humanity, those coming from the direction of Pisces and those coming from the direction of Virgo. These forces will be of no interest to those who endeavor to achieve everything by means of the dualism of polarity through positive and negative forces. 
the spiritual secrets that on earth can cause the spirit to stream through from the cosmos with the help of the dual forces of positive and negative magnetism. These spiritual secrets derive from the direction of Gemini. They are the forces of midday. Even in ancient times it was known that this is something cosmic, and scientists today know exoterically that behind Gemini in the zodiac, positive and negative magnetism exists in some way. Here it will be a matter of paralyzing what should be one from the cosmos through the revelation of duality. A matter of paralyzing this in a materialistic, egoistic way through the forces that stream to humanity, especially from Gemini. Forces that can be put to work entirely in the service of the double. Then there are the brotherhoods who want to bypass the mystery of Golgotha. They will make use of the human being's dual nature, which now in the fifth post-Atlantean period contains on the one hand the human being and on the other the lower animal nature. The human being truly is a centaur in a certain way, for he contains the lower animal nature astrally, and in a way the human part is simply grafted on to this animal nature. Here again we have a duality of forces in the way these two aspects work in the human being. This is a duality of forces that certain egoistic brotherhoods in a more easterly Indian direction will use to lead also the eastern part of Europe astray. That part of Europe which has the task of preparing for the sixth post-Atlantean period. This dualism makes use of the forces coming from Sagittarius. What lies in store for humanity is that the cosmic forces will be one for humanity in a dual way that is wrong or a single way that is right. This will bring a genuine renewal to astrology which is atavistic in its old form, a form in which it cannot continue to exist. Those who know about the cosmos will struggle against one another. Some will make use of the morning and evening processes in the way I have suggested. In the West, the midday processes will mostly be used, while the morning and evening processes are excluded, and in the East, the midnight processes will be used. It will no longer be a matter of making substances only according to the chemical processes of attraction and repulsion, for people will know that the substance will be different, depending on whether it is produced by means of morning and evening processes or by midday and midnight processes. They will know that such substances work quite differently on the trinity of God, virtue and immortality, or gold, health and life extension. It will not be possible to achieve anything bad by means of a collaboration between what comes from Pisces and Virgo. What will be achieved through these will, it is true, detach the mechanism of life somewhat from the human being, but it will not be a foundation for any kind of power or dominion of one group over another. The cosmic forces brought in from this direction will produce remarkable machines Machines that can be labor-saving for people because they will contain a degree of intelligence. And it will be the task of a science of the spirit concerned with the cosmos to ensure that all the great temptations emanating from these machine animals created by human beings themselves will be unable to have any damaging influence on them. Something important must be said in connection with all this. It is essential to prepare for it all by no longer assuming that realities are illusions and by really entering into a spiritual view of the world and gaining a spiritual grasp of the world. Much depends on seeing things for what they are. But we can only see them for what they are if we are able to apply to reality the concepts and ideas given to us by the spiritual science of anthroposophy. For the remainder of earthly existence, the dead will collaborate with us to a high degree. But how they collaborate will be what matters, for there will be great differences. 
It will be important that people on the earth behave in such a way that collaboration with the dead, in a good way, can be allowed to be guided by them, so that the impulse coming from them is the starting point coming from the spiritual world which the dead themselves experience after death. There will also, on the other hand, be many attempts to introduce the dead into human life by artificial means. The dead will be brought into human life via a detour through Gemini, which in quite a specific way will cause human vibrations to continue resonating in the machines. The cosmos will then move the machines via the detour I have just mentioned. If these problems arise, it will be important to use nothing improper, but only those elemental forces derived from nature itself. One must not introduce any improper forces into the life of these machines. In this occult field, one must not harness the human being to the mechanism in any way that makes use of the Darwinistic theory of selection in connection with human labor, as in the example I gave last time. I am giving you all these hints, which cannot of course exhaust the subject in such a short time, because I am sure you will continue to mull them over and endeavor to build a bridge between them and your own life experiences especially those we are gaining today in these difficult times. You will see how much clarity you will gain when you look at things in the light of these ideas. It is not a matter now of a confrontation between forces and constellations of forces, about which so much is being said in external, exoteric life, for it is a matter of quite other things. What is happening now is that a kind of veil is being drawn over the true impulses we are concerned with. Human forces are at work trying to garner something for themselves. What do they want to garner? Certain human forces are at work defending the impulses that were justifiable impulses up to the time of the French Revolution and were then also represented by certain secret schools. But now the endeavor is to represent them in a retarded, aramonic, luciferic form, in a way that would maintain a social order thought to have been overcome by humanity since the end of the 18th century. In the main, there are two camps in opposition to one another, the representatives of the principle that had been overcome by the end of the 18th century and the representatives of the present time. Of course, a great number of people instinctively represent the impulses of the present time. So those who are supposed to represent the old impulses of the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries will have to be harnessed by artificial means emanating from certain brotherhoods working to promote their group egoism. The most effective principle of modern times that can be used to extend one's power over the number of people one wishes to use is the economic principle, the principle of economic dependence. But this is merely the tool. The real concern is something quite different. The real concern is what you will have surmised from all the hints I have been giving. The economic principle is connected with all that can be used to make a huge number of people across the earth into a kind of army for these principles. These are the matters that confront one today, the ones that are really doing battle in the world today. Rooted in the West, there is the principle of the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries which makes itself invisible by clothing itself in the phrases of the revolution, the phrases of democracy, the principle which dons this mask and is striving to gain as much power as possible. It is advantageous for this principle if as many individuals as possible make no effort to see things as they really are and constantly allow themselves to be lulled by maya, the maya that is expressed in the words, there is a war going on between the Entente and the central powers. In reality, there is no such war. And our concern should be for quite other things that that are the true reality behind the maya. 
The battle of the Entente with the Central Powers is merely an illusion. We can reach a conclusion about what is really doing battle if we look behind things and illumine them in the way I am, for certain reasons, only hinting at. One must at least try for oneself not to mistake illusion for reality, and then the illusion will gradually dissolve as far as is necessary. One must try above all to see things as they show themselves to a realistic and unprejudiced view. If you look at all the things I have been unfolding here, you will find that even a remark I made on the side during these lectures was not as unimportant as it might have seemed. When I said that a a remark made by Mephistopheles to Faust, quote, I see that thou the devil knowest, close quote, would not have been made by him to Woodrow Wilson, this was not an unimportant observation. It was in fact intended to throw light on the situation. One must be able to look at these things without either sympathy or antipathy. They must be seen objectively. One must consider what constellations signify in something that is at work and what a person's own forces signify. Frequently something entirely different lies behind a person's own forces than what lies behind the mere constellation. Ask yourselves objectively what the value of Woodrow Wilson's brain would be if this brain did not happen to be seated upon the presidential chair of the North American Union. Assume that this brain were situated in a different constellation. That is where it would reveal its own personal force. So it is the constellation that matters. Let me put it in the abstract and radically, although not to illustrate the instance I have just mentioned for I would not do such a thing in this very neutral country. Apart from that instance, excuse me, apart from that instance, consider the important insight that would be revealed if one were to ask whether a certain brain attained its value through being illuminated spiritually in a special way, in the sense I have been describing in these lectures, or whether its value scarcely exceeded the result obtained by placing it in a scale and balancing it against weights in the other scale. The moment you penetrate fully into all the secrets of the double, whom I mentioned last time, you will find yourself able to assess the value of brains that are merely lumps which you have placed on a scale, lumps which can be brought to life solely by the double. All these things appear grotesque to people today, but everything that is grotesque about them must come to be seen as perfectly ordinary if certain matters are to be guided from harmful into beneficial channels. There is no point in constantly talking round them. You must come to realize that all the wishy-washy talk of, in quotes, cosmic religiosity, or in quotes, how powerful the yearning for it is, or in quotes, the movement that is undertaking to discover and unveil the circulations of life not accessible to the senses, and so on, is also nothing other than a means of spreading fog over these matters which ought actually to be entering the world in clarity, which can only work in clarity, and which above all ought only to be carried in clarity into human life as practical, moral, and ethical impulses. I can only bring you certain isolated hints. So now I leave it to your own meditation to build further in these matters, Much is aphoristic. But if you take summaries such as the zodiac I have drawn here and really use it as material for meditation, you will be able to derive a very great deal from them. The end of Lecture 7, that is the end of the lectures in this book, Secret Brotherhoods and the Mystery of the Double, but not, in fact, the end of the lectures in the Collected Works volume in the German, shall we say, of 178. I have recorded those for another book, and I'm going to append them So there will be two more lectures available.